His latest award-winning work in Michael McGowan's Still Mine can be seen in theaters this Friday. But first, James Cromwell joins me in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Hi. What a pleasure it is to have you Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to be here. That uh, Canadian Screen Awards speech we just heard, you you said you hate contests and awards, and that you thought you you, you won just by being there. What did you mean by that? Well... I don't think you can make comparisons between performances. I mean, it's apples and oranges. Uh, I, I was in a film last year, a little small French film, won seven Academy Awards. It costs, uh, I don't know, $15 million, and The it artist. Was up, and it was up against The Artist, and it was up against Hugo, which cost $250 million. I mean, how are you supposed to compare those two films? Uh, I have a... Um, I have a solution to this, which is to allow all five nominees to come on stage and be uh, given their citation and acknowledged, and then they will have voted among themselves. You can't vote for yourself, and it would only take two rounds of voting, and then one of them steps forward and says, we, the five nominees, have chosen (laughs) this performance as the outstanding performance of the year, open the envelope and give it to one of them. So the people seeing it see there are no losers in this business and you can't compare different uh, works of art. Uh, uh, Everything stands on its own. I thought, uh, you know, you do it in Hollywood because it makes it such a big difference in your career. Mm -hmm. But they keep the camera on you and they did this time too. I I thought it was ludicrous. I said, I'm not going to win this thing. It's Canadian Film Awards. It's going to go to a Canadian but they some th- this idea of what it looks like when you fail. Only Martin was the only one when he his name was not announced. He went, oh my God, Martin oh, Short, yeah. yeah, Martin Short. And so I thought, you know, that's really what we want to do. And yet we put on this face like, oh, I'm so <laughs> delighted that Kevin Spacey won. <laughs> but you're being very selfless. I mean, uh, it, it. How do you mean? It, well, I mean, it, it's um, on on some level, I, I have to believe it feels good to win a Best Actor Award. Well, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye, mate, but, <laughs> you know, you don't actually feel anything. And I, I meant what I said. You know, it, it, first of all, you don't act in a vacuum. Mm. Everybody is, it's, you, you have, have to acknowledge all those people who have made it possible. Uh, I, I believe in acknowledging people's works. I just don't like making it into a winner and loser contest. There, there is no loser in a profession right. that allows you to express right. yourself and you get paid for it. It's wonderful. Well, hopefully... One of the upshots of the of when awards do happen, I mean, when the Canadian Screen Awards happened, all those awards, besides uh, for your film, which is uh, still mine, which is uh, hopefully gets a bump from those the, the award too, but all those awards that went to war, which rebel that film. I mean, at, at the very least, one hopes that 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 creates the conditions where people will then know about the film and go and see it. Right? I understand. It's a little different from. Argo winning it's because the, people already know Argo. It's not but. the end that I disagree with. It's the means to get to the end. I know you have... Listen, the Academy Awards were created to publicize the film industry. They mm. didn't really give a damn who won the thing. It's just putting it out there that we have a film industry and look at us, look at us, look at us. So I understand the reason. The business reason makes sense to right. me. But the means... The fact that somebody has to go through the experience of not winning. And it's painful. When they've made, when, when, when they're yes, also when, being acknowledged that's for right, making, they're making the, one of the best. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> this, this film, uh, I, I told you before we hit the air, such a poignant film, a, a beautiful film. In Still Mine, you play this quietly rebellious 87 year old farmer named Craig Morrison, someone fighting City Hall to build a house on his own land. There, there's a slow burning anger that fuels his character. In in real life, James, you're known as one of Hollywood's most politically outspoken actors. Was was the character's defiance something you could relate to? Uh, I, I suppose so. You know, I wish I, when I had originally read the script, I had been more conscious because none of that entered into my choice about doing it. Um, I, I read it very cursorily and I made suggestions to Michael which were off the top of my head and they were disastrous and he Included, he wrote a second draft, included it, and I went off to do another job. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to do this picture. I started to read it, and I said, this is not as good as it was. And everything that was wrong was it with it was the suggestions that I had made. <laughs> so I, it wasn't. I, now that I have seen it a number of times, I can now look at the thing and see Craig, my, that character, yes. as a character in a movie, not not me acting. And now I see, oh. 
he really is making a political stand. He's an activist. Of yes, sorts. he's an, yes. Uh, exactly, and I I believe in his position, and I believe the uh, the uh, in the actions that he takes, because I think it's necessary to resist this. Uh, these are uh, rules and regulations put into effect to protect us from ourselves, because. As he says to the building inspector, there are houses out there that were built 200 years ago. Where was your building code then? They're still standing. That's because 200 years ago, and even in my lifetime, 50 years ago, people built houses because they knew the people they were building them for, and they cared about building, and they did the best job possible. They made a living, but, and it was fine. Now, everything is money. You build a house for money, you buy a house for money, you sell it, everything, everything is money. What do I get out of it? And what happens is when, when it's money, somebody will cheat. So they make rules and regulations so that people don't get cheated. But unfortunately, they don't have the capacity, the empathy to say to, to look at an individual case and say, mm. no, you, you, it's okay, do, do your thing, it's okay. And we need a, the paradigm shift that is coming has got to include an awareness and sensitivity to what it is that is necessary for another person to live out their dreams. Okay, hang on a second. I want to come back to that, but yeah. uh, two steps back. Yeah. You said you read the script cursorily. Yeah. Uh, that's surprising to me because huh. you, seem, you seem like the kind of guy who would pour over something quite fastidiously before you agree or disagree to do it. Yeah, see, it's a... The thing is, oh, I, has the wool been pull, pulled over? No, Are no. you disillusioning me about my James no, Cromwell? No, you, listen, <laughs> I, people say, so So, how do you choose? You know, you've done some wonderful films, and how do you choose? I don't choose. This This is, it's all written. You understand what I'm saying? No. You it's, mean like Tevia says in Fiddler on the that, Roof, it's, it's written? It's all written. It's all written. These, this is not by happenstance. Things come when they're supposed to come. If you resist and you miss it, that's okay. You didn't learn that lesson. You'll have to learn it again some other time. And the opportunities, that's why... So where is it written? In your instincts? No, it's, it's, it's written wherever it's written. But you have to say yes. You, you say yes. Bec- something, something catches your fancy. For me, it was I loved the way Michael responded. He took my original suggestions, and I sort of blew it off. Then when I had to convince... I didn't have to convince him. He knew. But I had to say to him... What you wrote was perfect, and I made a mistake. Let's go back to the way it was. Hmm. We talked for two hours on the phone, and it wasn't, he didn't gloat, he didn't make me wrong, he didn't, you know, he listened, he had arguments. We talked back and forth, and I realized, oh, this is a guy that I can have a collaboration. That's what you want as an artist. You want a collaborative event where both of you participate. It's his vision. What you see is Michael's. I support Michael's vision in my work, but I want to do it with a certain amount of belief and authenticity and verisimilitude so that I have, uh, I have a respect for the work that I've done. And Michael created that um, in his crew, in his writing, in his direction. So you, I'm guessing that you've often or at least on many occasions said no to, to some projects. I've said no to, as I say, you know, people. I, what, what, I don't, cho- what? I don't choose them. They, they choose me, and and they've and wonderful ones have chosen me. I should have said no to a number of films. Eraser was one of them. Uh, <laughs> but, Come on, that's yeah. an iconic. That's film. a classic. It is. I mean, for some of us, <laughs> no, it's a, of our generation. So. Uh, uh, this character. So in real life, you're you're in your early seventies. Uh, you're a lot younger than eighty seven years old. Yeah. The character you play in the film, but the film is is very much. Uh, is kind of a meditation on aging, mm-hmm. and and we don't think of an eighty-seven-year-old as someone who can build a home with his own hands the way no. this guy does, let alone run their farm. Um, were you out to break age stereotypes with this role? Do you do you see that as part of what this film is 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 meditating upon? Oh, it's really nice. You know, as you as, as you get the age, even at the very young age of seventy-three, as a man, you haven't experienced this yet. You disappear. You really, you go into the woodwork, mainly if you're as attracted to women as I am, it's they no longer see you. You're, you're, you're not there. And you're not really, unless I'm, I'm lucky with the, what I, the work that I do, but if you're... If, if you're also you're, 100 feet tall. And I, yeah, that, yeah all, so. that helps. So it's hard to imagine you disappearing anyway. So but. well, there's but I still have that sense, you know, the right. sense when you walk down the streets of New York and no, if nobody knows you, you just you just disappear. Hmm. And when did you start feeling that? 
Um, geez, I don't know. In my 60s, I guess, you know, as it went on. I had it younger when I used to be in New York. No one knew who I was. And I would carry my beautiful son on my shoulders. And a very attractive lady would come down. I, know, I don't mean it. I have a kid on my shoulders. I'm not going to do anything. Right. And in New York, they, they will not look at you in the eye. They walk right past. And I would get hostile. I would say, what am I, chopped liver here? What? Are, come on. Hey, give me a look. Right. <laughs> so, uh, and that, uh, it's frustrating. So, and... We don't take into consideration that people, older people, have a viable life, that they make love, that they still have desires, that they still have capacities, that they still can make a contribution, that they shouldn't, shouldn't be de deprived of a, a comfortable and sustaining life simply because they're old, shunted aside. Uh, do you think that's always been the case, or do you think no. that's be we are in a current moment of obsessed with with youth? We are obsessed with youth. Youth sells. It's all. I believe it's financial. I don't think it's the natural instinct. It certainly isn't in Asia. It certainly isn't in the Middle East. There's veneration for people. They are the elders right. among uh, you know first Americans, the first nations, uh, yeah. first nations people. Th th that veneration. That that's where the stored wisdom is, and. Kids don't, are losing value, the, the, all that knowledge that, that it's not oral anymore, but all that learned experience is wasted if kids think they have to reinvent the wheel, if they've had no experience about what somebody else has been through, about, about surviving this. What the kids have got to go through in the near future is going to be horrendous. It's like the people who went through uh, Nazi Germany. You, you have to, and, and I mean that seriously, that bad. And you have to learn, how do you survive? How do you, how do you hold on to what's valuable in you and not simply give up and give in? What were you referring to in particular when we talk about things getting that bad? Okay. The, you take, we had an administration, the Bush administration, that uh, condoned and, and created a torture program and carried that out worldwide, uh, uh, horrendous acts that are illegal and unethical and unconstitutional. Uh, and a man, a CIA officer, exposed this on national television. Yes. He so far is the only person prosecuted and jailed for the torture program because he outed the program. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't release the name of a CIA officer which Cheney's office did do with Valerie Plame, he simply said to a reporter who asked him who could he talk to, took a card out of a fellow CIA officer that had written on it, CIA, gave it to the man. He's been prosecuted for that. And nobody who created that program or implemented that, Mr. Brennan is going to be uh, nominated as, has been nominated and uh, approved as the head of the CIA. And he created the torture program. Ron Paul wants the president to guarantee that some American sitting in a coffee shop in Detroit is not hit with a Stinger missile as part of a d domestic assassination program before he votes on Bren's nomination. And you get no hear nothing from the White House. So I'm, things, our civil liberties are being taken away from us. There's going to be a... And you're saying that without a... Um, a respect accorded to, or um, or a pl even a platform for uh, um, the, those uh, our elders. Yes, you're saying that younger people are left in an abyss in I, the midst of I, all this. I am. That is exactly. I what understand. I it, it's interesting to hear you talk. I mean, your your father was was one of the blacklisted directors yeah. in Hollywood during the 1950s. Uh, tell me about the effect. I actually tried to find this in researching you and couldn't couldn't find it. The effect that 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 had on your own political outlook growing up. One, one would assume that it was a direct line from you to your father in terms of your activism. Is that true? Well, you know, my father was not an activist. He was caught up in that because of a comment that he made at a party that Adolf Maju overheard and misinterpreted, which was to do with the Moscow Art Theater and how the Russians uh, take kids who are graduated from a conservatory and send them to the to the pr provinces, and they work their way back into Moscow. My father said, that's the way you do it. What do we do in America? We set, send the best and the brightest out of these colleges to L.A. or to New York. We use them up in one year, and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. 
on that basis, Manju testified before the House on American Activities that the biggest communist in all of Hollywood was John Cromwell. My, my father testified he had nothing to say. He left New York before the Communist Party really uh, uh, made itself known. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting story. If you'd like to hear it, uh, he was had, a, had signed a million-dollar contract with Dory Sherry at RKO, and Howard Hughes had bought the studio from Dory Sherry and, of course, wanted my father out, but he couldn't fire him because he'd have to pay him a million dollars. So he gave him a picture to direct call, I Married a Communist which my father, realizing what he was doing, said, yeah, I'll direct the picture, but you've got to rewrite this script. It's just crap. And, of course, they got writer after writer after writer. Couldn't do it. And Howard Hughes paid him a million dollars. My father left, went to New York, was in a play with Henry Fonda called Point of No Return, won a Tony, had a wonderful career in back in the theater where he started, had a career in resident theater, the Guthrie with my mother. So... But where does young me, James Cromwell well, fit into all this? I'm, so I'm a kid. It's 53. I'm 13. Mm-hmm. He comes to New York. I finally, he's near me now because my father and mother were divorced, so I was in the East Coast. I begin to see him work. I see a working actor, elegant, uh, uh, successful, happily married, living in New York, having a life. I don't think anything about it. I'm going to be a mechanical engineer, design sports cars. He takes me to uh, Sweden where he's directing a film. I look at these wonderful women, you know, uh, uh, Eva Dahlbeck, Mybrit Nielsen, my father creating this thing. And I think, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. So first of all, it was why I became. I wanted to be a director, but I became an actor because there wasn't directing. And then he... He cut out a little squib. I went to Europe after my first job at Cleveland, and I came back, and he had cut out a little squib. It said a theater that was touring the South was looking for actors and directors, and I went down and auditioned, and I got it. I never, I didn't know what happened in the South, got off the plane, went to New Orleans in the, the quarter, went to where we were going to stay, and it had a plaque on the side of the wall, coloreds only. And I thought, oh, isn't that quaint? That must be from Civil War days. <laughs> Get up there, a nice black lady showed us where we were going to sleep, went to a restaurant with the head of the theater who was black, and the owner came over and said, you have to leave. Right. And we got thrown out. So I got an education. Then it began. I, I, you know, I went through. Well, you go on to support the Black Panthers in the I, 60s. I, yeah. So yeah, that yeah. began. Right. My father tangentially right. actually created the circumstance that led to my politicization. But, I'm speaking with James Cromwell, his latest film, Still Mine, uh, out this Friday. He's won the Best Actor Award, by the way, for the, from the Canadian Screen Awards uh, for his role in this film. Also stars Geneviève Bujold. So you support the Black Panthers in the 60s. You drop, you dodge the Vietnam War draft. Uh, you land a role in the, in, in, on the TV hit All in the Family, where you, you play Archie Bunker's friend Stretch Cunningham. Do you, did, did you or do you see your political end acting life as two sides of the same coin. Exactly. I mean, your politics, the choices that you make as a character, everybody's choices are political. That is, the, that is politics. And, and so, you know, there's, there's a politics in relationship. There's politics in your job. There's politics in your relationship to your local government, your state government, federal government. Uh, the, it's all, to me, it's all politics. And... Uh, in the best sense of the word, and the worst sense. And so I think it informs the choices. I think the reason we do the work that we do is to present a fully rounded, politically engaged character, and I don't mean an activist, I mean somebody who makes choices based on political uh, decisions that they've come to, and you then let the audience decide, oh, what he's doing, Craig... Uh, resistance makes sense to me. Mm. Arthur Hoggett's in Babe, his desire to see outside of the box and allow this pig to do what it do, does to serve the pig as the pig is serving him, that's also, a, to me, that's a political statement. Yeah, it's a comedy, and people say, oh, isn't it funny? And, mm. But they're resisting because they have, there's a cubbyhole. I mean, right. there's a, right. a box, right. and it, the pig does not belong in that box. You said you, you're not a liberal, 
you're no. you're you're a radical progressive. It's interesting That's because right. for for a long time in your country and still in, in some ways, uh, liberal was a bad word. I remember mm. back to that election in '88 when Dukakis you wouldn't say the word, you know. Yeah. Uh, or if, uh, but liberal's a, a bad word for you from the other side now. <laughs> why is why do you not want to be called a liberal? I remember uh, a rally that was in Washington and uh, Stokely Carmichael spoke. And he said, you know, he said, I actually preser- I prefer reactionaries and conservatives because I always know where they're coming from. I can, I can pick that out. But a liberal, you'll never know. They'll say one thing right to your face and turn around and, and stab you in the back by, by changing their opinion. And, and a wonderful writer, uh, Izzy, Izzy, I think his name was Wellstone, uh, he came out. He was infuriated because he always considered himself a liberal in the old sense. But something happened to liberals that just became party politics. And so uh, I, I, progressive, I will go, but I'm on the radical side of progressive. So that makes for some interesting uh, questions to ask you because, I mean, you played George H.W. Bush in, in Oliver Stone's W. I, I mean, you're obviously not a fan of the Bush administration, I'll and yet say. you received a lot of acclaim for your sympathetic portrait of the man and his relationship with his son, mm-hmm. George W. Bush. Tell me about connecting to that character. Um, Oliver didn't want me to do the part, but Josh insisted, so Oliver acquiesced, and we would rehearse. Uh, Oliver was basically trying to figure out what he was going to do with the scene, and I was doing my homework, and when you look up the Bush family, it gets worse. I mean, it's a cesspool. And I would come in with a new piece of information every time, and I would announce it to them. Do you know what that family... And finally, Oliver said to me, Jamie, you know, you're not going to be able to play this character if you've got so many opinions. And I thought, oh, come on. I've heard that since I was a, that's, I, I'll be able to do it. But I, instead of, instead of looking at the heart of the character because I didn't like him, I sort of created this caricature. It happened that our first scene we shot was where I confront my son who's an al- who is drunk and who brings his younger, younger brother home. And I came down very quietly in my voice because the elder Bush shoves everything down. So it sticks. His personality sticks right there in his throat. It's duplicitous because his father was a drunk and his father beat him. And the family didn't let anybody know. They didn't tell the truth to themselves and they didn't tell the truth to the world. So he doesn't tell the truth and the lie gets stuck right in his throat. So I'm doing it like this. And Oliver says, no, no, Jamie, I want more passion. I said, what do you mean I'm more passionate? I'm in my house. I'm in control. He said, no, no, I want you like your father, like Prescott. So every time we would do a take, he'd push me more, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and finally I had to let go of the character altogether and play the father mm. with a son who was rebellious and, and disappointed him and dealing with that, which I understand as a father. And that was because of Oliver. And he took all the caricature out of me and made me play, because that was his conceit that George Bush, George Bush is not a stupid man. That That's a complete misconception. George, the younger, Herbert, oh, the younger the sh- one. Shrub. George W. Shrub is not a stupid guy. I've, I watched him very carefully. He adopted that in order to get elected. What Oliver's conceit was that the dysfunction in the younger Bush is from comes from his relationship with his father, trying to live up to his father's expectation, at the same time really angry at his father because his father left the family to pursue a career and had affairs, which the family knew so all over. So you grew everybody. into that role thinking of George H.W. H. H. Bush as a father. Yeah, and, I did. And, 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 and do you think that you were fair to him in the end? I think I was. And have you ever met him? No. The Bushes? No. no They've like never that. come up to you and said, hey, no. listen, pal. <laughs> no. Well, you have met uh, Barack Obama. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> yes, in 2009, you attended the <laughs> annual White House Easter Roll where you met uh, President Barack Obama. I mean, very few people I could ever imagine in the world would, would have the um, gumption to do this. You used that meeting to express some of your political views. Yeah. Describe for me what happened and President Obama's reaction. I had a letter... Uh, that was written to a friend of mine, um, Mike Farrell of MASH, and uh, it was from Governor Ryan's wife to Obama because Obama, well, when he was running for president, had come to a fundraiser in Illinois, and Mike had been at a table with Mrs. Mrs. Ryan, whose husband, who had been governor, had been put in jail for embezzlement 
of a very small amount of money for 10 years. He was going, either he was going to die in prison or she was going to die while he was in prison. And so Obama said to Mrs. Ryan, I, it's really unfortunate that this happened and I will do everything I can to rectify this and get a compassionate leave. He came back after the event and said the same thing again and nothing happened. So Mrs. Ryan said to Mike, if, if Jamie is going, would he take the letter? And I was delighted to do it. And I told him this. I handed him a letter. I mean, the expression, his face went absolutely This is President sti- Obama. The president. Where are you sti- when you hand this to him? I'm in, the white, I'm in the White House in the, in the yellow reception room. And there's room. been I, dinner or I something? Or, or no, 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 no. We're, we're going to, we're going to uh, he and I and Michelle and other people, I'm going to read stories. Some people are doing other things. Right. Uh, uh, Bob Marley's son is there. He's going to do some things. Okay. And so we're presented. And I'm with my lady. She's talking to Michelle. So I hand him the letter. It, it, I tell you, he didn't even blink. It went right past him, right to some aid. That went right into the shredder. Mm. Then I went to Michelle, and I complimented her on her organic garden. And I had a copy of a f- documentary called The Garden, which was a wonderful thing that 327 Hispanic people built on 14 acres in downtown Los Angeles, which was bulldozed. And I said... Congratulations on your garden. Listen, this is a documentary about what happens when people of color try to do the same thing you did in the White House. And her face dropped. And whoop, that went, that went away. I, I don't know what happened. You know, What I, did the president say to you when you gave him the letter? He said nothing. Nothing. Nada. Like, oh, yes, I'll take it. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, I know. I know Governor Ryan. And, did he remember the event? No, did, I'd have to. Did, I think he promising did. the. No. Oh, he, he didn't remember it any more than he remembered all the promises he made to the American people while he was running for election. Well, and you said everything Obama promised, from Guantanamo to withdrawing from Iraq, he hasn't delivered. They're not going to move out of Iraq. Not a chance in hell we got suckered. Well, the U.S. is no longer in Iraq. He, Who he, says? Well, I mean, they, 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 he's, he's oh, just, pledged to, to just, leave Iraq. Just, we don't know. Do we know anything about the bases that are left in Iraq? Do we know, we know there are no American soldiers? Do we know what? And listen, if we left, that's really wonderful. And it, it's, look at it, what's happening in Afghanistan. Are we going to leave Afghanistan? They say we're going to leave Afghanistan, but oh no, the Secretary of the Defense is saying we'll have to keep around fourteen thousand troops in f- for the foreseeable future in Afghanistan. Of course they will. What were the, what are the Taliban? But do you think that I mean, and and I appreciate what you're saying, but I've had this <laughs> debate with 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 folks like uh, you know Tom Morello or. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, Steve, uh, um, who's a great uh, country singer, Steve Earl, Steve Earl, mm. uh, with Tom Morello or Steve Earl who come in here and, and 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 we talk about what you do when you're a progressive activist like you mm-hmm. and you have a liberal, uh, uh, well, somebody who's, who purports to be a liberal uh-huh. in the White House. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you heard that State of the uh, Union well. speech yeah. and you hear him uh, talking about gay rights, uh-huh. um, uh, m- mentioning um, climate change and, and wanting to change that, environmental, uh, um, talking about uh, um, uh, same-sex marriage. The- these things, do-, do they tweak you at all as something that's more positive than having the Republicans Same-sex marriage doesn't, it, it counts desperately for the people who want to get married, and I understand that, but politically, it's fine. It only helps him recognizing he got a lot of money and support from the gay community because of his stand. That's, that's terrific. Guantanamo remains the same. He can talk about the XL pipeline, but the XL pipeline, if, if he will surprise me if he does not approve that. I believe he will approve it. I think it is how it will be a crime against humanity. Our, our government would want it. And, that's, it, and your government does want it. Yes. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's a disaster. If the, all that oil is dug out of the ground, not only the damage it's doing to Canada, and then it's pumped and refined in in Texas, and then sent out to the rest of the world and burned, We're as a, we as a planet are in desperate trouble. But do you think there's a difference between having Barack Obama in the White House and George Bush in the yes, White House? Yes, I do. The difference is that you knew what you got with George Bush, and a million of us went out in the street to try to stop that war. Did we stop the war? No. But that's not the way it happens. Gloria Steinem said it takes a, it takes a hundred years. These movements, the women's movement, takes a hundred years. Of course, we might have another hundred years of war would be untenable. The difference is that every, Obama's election 
puts everybody to sleep. Breeds quiescence. That's exactly, exactly. 50,000 of us just went out to demonstrate against the pipeline and marched in front of the White House. And where was Obama? He was in Florida playing golf with the very people who were putting in the pipeline. Do you think he was listening? No, he's not listening to 50,000 people dropping the bucket. It's the guy who, it's the corporation that puts up $500,000 to be on that committee to guarantee that the Democratic Party will be brought back into. And, and you see what they do in Congress? It's, now, not all of them. I'm, I'm a, Dennis Kucinich is a hero of mine. Uh, and there are, Feingold was a hero of mine. There are lots of, Rangel, there are lots of really wonderful people in there. But the system is a crock. And you think that, I mean, this, this is, just to, um, to put a fine point on it, this is I- inherent in Obama's politics, that he's, that he's sort of wishy-washy, that you can't depend on him, that, that, or, or in fact cagey, as you've implied. Or is it someone who just in your system can't get, I mean, we saw with health care, uh-huh. can't get progressive legislation through without having to make a bunch of compromises? Uh, the... The directive from the White House to Senator, I think it was Bacchus, who was the head of the committee that uh, that investigated the viability of uh, national health care, was you are not to, to bring up or discuss or debate a single-payer system. It wasn't even on the agenda. That came from the White House. If, if they had talked about it and if he had supported it, he came out for single-payer. If he had supported single-payer... Yeah, he might he might have he, he might have lost. Would have been a great fight, and we'd still be fighting the fight. Thirty five million people are now obligated to buy insurance from insurance companies. So the insurance companies, although they raised a stink, they wind up it's just more money in their pocket. Yes, people who were denied insurance get insurance, but what about the fifteen million people that are still left that don't have insurance? You despair for the future of your country. No, I don't. I'm very optimistic. You are. How are the you Occupy optimistic? movement is the most is the best thing that's happened in all, since the '60s. What happened in Madison, Wisconsin? What happened? It, there are people. I just heard a thing about this conference about talking about the internet and access to the internet, being able to open your phone up and change the SIM, which they do in in Europe, which is five years in prison and a five hundred thousand dollar fine in the United States. He's he's supposedly going to. You change. feel like it's bubbling under that there's that people want to change and the and and the, the can is going to kick back. And I don't mean that terrible guy who's trying to get rid of Social Security. But we're, people are going to stand up. It's the whole system is fracturing. It doesn't have to be this way. We need a leader. He could be a leader if he wanted to be a leader. We want him to be a leader. Bless his heart. I I hope he, I hope he has a. A change of heart, but right now his policies on torture, on the drone program, uh, on domestic surveillance, on torture, uh, on uh, uh, assassination, uh, on the what I don't know what they call it, where they don't even know who the person is. They just think there's a likelihood, and so they send a missile into that. Um, I forgot it's got a name. Uh, these are Guantanamo, uh, what's happening to those people, uh, death, federal death penalty. I mean, you can go on and on and on and on and on. These are issues that the American public are ahead of him. You're saying the chances are slim he's carrying around your, the letter you gave him in his pocket right now. I think that it thinks that <laughs> zero. <laughs> Let me bring this back to Still Mine, yeah. uh, this, this film and your acting career today. We talked about, I mean, this, this film very much being about love and aging and um, you obviously love what you do, and you are more. It seems you're more professionally active than than you've ever been. Uh, how would you feel at a more advanced age if you were unable to act anymore? How how what does acting mean to you in terms of fulfilling your life? Uh, well, I don't know because I've never not done it. I mean, I've done it for so long. Um, I'm just started to transition into teaching. I would I would like to teach. I think I have uh, something of value to impart. Uh, Not cynical, uh, very optimistic about where we could go, both as filmmakers and theater people, performers, directors, uh, uh, making the kind of work that I believe uh, is necessary to make a difference. Uh, There are techniques that I, you know, I've honed over my lifetime that I think are valuable. So I, I. I don't feel that I have to stop. I could be just an ordinary person and 
if I were, I would probably be down with Daryl Hannah and Mark Ruffalo tying, you know, chaining myself to a bulldozer, mm-hmm. which I may do anyway, because uh, that's what it's going to take to stop it. And so that activism. Now, no one will ask me questions anymore. I won't. You won't be interviewing me. I'll be just another schmo. But it's okay. On the contrary, it's going to. I would no- always have you in here. Uh, it's too sure. interesting. <laughs> it's going to take all of us. Everybody has got to make a stand because if you don't, we deserve what we get. Sorry, I, I wanted to ask you this earlier, mm. but just based on how passionate you've, impassioned you've been about your politics in, in this conversation, has there was there ever a time where you worried about outing yourself, as I know a lot of performers do, in such an overt way about your politics in terms of the, it affecting the gigs you're going to get? I, I, to my memory, I only flinched once. Uh, there's a wonderful wetlands in Los Angeles called the Biona Wetlands, and they took me out there and showed me this incredible n- part of nature that had been untouched. And Spielberg was going to build his studio there because the helicopter ride from there to the airport was shorter. And so they said, would you would you uh, join us? I said, I'd be delighted. And my wife was very, then wife was very upset with me, and she got her friend Richard Dreyfus to talk to me. And he said, Jamie, there's no such thing as a blacklist. But do you think when your name comes up at DreamWorks that somebody's going to say, is he the schmuck who's. So, and I called up. So I called him up and I said, look, I support you and I, 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 I will I do it. I'll give you money. I'll march with you, but I cannot be your poster child. What happens? The next day I look, who do you think is out there chained to a fence? Martin Sheehan. Does Martin care? No, he doesn't care. He doesn't care. Do you think you've ever not gotten a job because of your politics? I have no idea. Probably. Probably. Do you care? No. No. It's, no. I mean, I'm, I'm alive. I'm here. I do the work. I mean, no, I did this, as they all love to say, this little film in Canada, you know? Well, and we don't say that. I, that I know. sounds like an American yeah, talking that's about exactly, it. That's exactly uh, it. On American that talk. note, you, you've said, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes of yours, amongst many, you've said, I'm on a list. That list includes Gene Hackman, Donald Sutherland, and Michael Caine. I'm on the bottom of that list. <laughs> and if they all have lucrative jobs some elsewhere and the film needs a tall, skinny old guy, I get the role. So self-deprecating, modest. But, you know, will you concede that you've had and, and continue to enjoy a stellar and acclaimed acting career? I've, I am grateful, eternally grateful. I am a lucky fella. Uh, it doesn't really matter about the list. There is a list. I know there is a list. Uh, it, and I don't care. I don't care about packaging. I don't care about what they do. I care that somebody like Michael McGowan, when he's thinking about making his picture, thinks, oh, I like that guy. Uh, let's, let's, let's try that guy. So, And I assume that that will go on until I no longer care to do it. At least I hope it is. And Michael wouldn't have been put off because of my politics. Uh, he sees me as an actor, which is the way I want. I don't want to be known for my politics. I have a political point. I want to be known for what I do as an actor and that people enjoy it. They say they do. Uh, and uh, the rest of it can take care of itself. It's not my concern. It's a great pleasure to get to talk to you. Likewise. Thank you for coming in. My Let's pleasure. do it again. Yeah, great. That's actor James Cromwell. He stars opposite Jean-Vierre Bujol in Michael McGowan's film Still Mine. It opens in theaters this Friday, Still Mine. James Cromwell has been with me here in Studio Q.